Hey everyone, welcome to part three on this series on color management. I know I originally said I was going to do this in three parts, but I've since decided to try to make each segment about one particular aspect. And so I'm making them a little more specific, a little bit shorter. Uh, that way you can review things if you want later, or you can skip stuff if you really don't care. And all you want to do is know how to do it. Now, uh, the challenge I have with a lot of people is that they don't understand it. And so they try something and it doesn't work. And so they just try some something to fix their problem and make it work. So I see a lot of people that develop kind of a what I call a hack system. And I've had several cases where they get a new printer and suddenly it doesn't work. And they've either got to rehack it or the best thing to do is make sure you just set it up right. The first part we talked about when we create a device to capture or produce color, the colors it captures or produces aren't really relevant. What we have to do is characterize the device by shooting known colors or printing known colors, measuring result and creating a way to translate the color that it captures to the color that it's supposed to capture or print. And that's kind of the original start of color management where you use a profile to do that. And the second part we talked about the two theories on color management that evolved through the 90s, one developed by the ICC uh, International Color Consortium. In this system, we have a computer as the heart and soul of it with this magical black box of color management system and built in. And the devices themselves, we don't actually change the data till we send it to a device. And the advantage there is that we can maximize the capability of any device. We have a device that's got far more color capability. We haven't reduced the colors in our storage space until, we're, until we get it ready to send it. The other one, the concept was sRGB. And that workflow is, says, look, we're gonna make all the devices use a common color space. And the downside is that color space has to be fairly small because you've got to base it on the lowest common denominator. Now, I'm not going to talk much more about sRGB workflow. I'm not saying it's bad. If you want to use it, great. I use it sometimes if I'm shooting Little League soccer or Little League sports. If you're watching this series because you want to really understand high-end color management, I assume that you really don't care about that, at, at least at this point. So we're only going to deal with the ICC workflow. Remember, in that workflow, we talked about the fact that we needed this storage space, this container space. And this is where a lot of people get confused because they don't really understand what this container space is and they misread and, and read too much into it, its size or what it does. And really it's, it's transparent. Once you select your container space, it's completely transparent. The idea that you don't see colors, well, yeah, you never do because they're always translated to the output space. But if your monitor can't show a color and we translate it so we get a perception of the relationship of colors, we can still work with those colors because we're modifying them and we're maintaining relationships. If we get a better device, a better monitor, suddenly those colors are now available and we can use them. So let me clarify a little bit about this storage space. Now we're gonna get into it more in the last part because setting up your working spaces in Photoshop is an important step, but that's gonna be one, that's gonna be part of our final step. But we wanna make sure we understand in Photoshop, this is called the working space. Infinity Photo, I don't know what they call it, but any pixel editing program, you have to define the limit of what uh, the program is allowed to do with your colors. And so that's based on what space you're gonna store that in. So if you're gonna store it in sRGB, then it's gonna say, okay, that means I can't work with any colors outside of sRGB. If I'm gonna store it in Adobe RGB, that means I can work with those colors. And we're gonna get into the, the comparison of those spaces and where the colors differ here in a few minutes. In a programs such as Lightroom or Capture One, which is a raw processor, you're not actually manipulating pixels. All you're doing is changing the metadata. And the metadata describes how pixels will be created once you render a file from it. And so those programs by default have a built-in uh, workspace or storage space, and you don't really need to worry about it because it's really setting the limits that you work with but it's only when you export it, then you've got to choose, okay, once I make this file out of Lightroom or out of Capture One that I'm going to open in Photoshop, what storage space do I want to allow Photoshop to use? Because if you say you're going to make it in one space, such as Adobe RGB or sRGB, and then you want to use it in a wider gamut space, well, it's too late because you've already rendered it out and clipped everything into the smaller space. And we'll talk a lot about that in the final uh part of this series where we actually set it up on the computer, we go through the steps, we really understand it, and I think that'll help you. But I just wanna make sure we understand this storage space concept, what we're talking about here. So what I wanna do now is let's talk about the three color spaces, and mainly we wanna talk about how they evolved. 
unlike a uh, device profile, which is based on a specific circumstance and specific device, these uh, working spaces or these container spaces are what are called absolute profiles, which are developed colorimetrically without reference to external uh, influences. And I shouldn't say external uh, device. In other words, you're not using a device to determine it. However, you are using a device to influence how you develop it, and that's kind of what we need to understand. So the first one we're going to look at is sRGB. Now, sRGB was developed to be this universal space. And sRGB, if we lay it alongside of the CIE XYZ space, which shows human vision, this is what it encompasses. That's what this graph here represents. And it's a pretty small space. And one of the challenges of sRGB is there's really nothing out there that doesn't c capture or produce colors beyond it anymore. Uh, sRGB was developed based on the capabilities of a mid-90s CRT, and that's just old technology. So in the around 1998, Adobe, uh, they were developing technologies mainly for printing. They had a problem in the CMYK color gamut of some, some processes had a lot better response in the blues and greens than sRGB allowed. So they developed Adobe RGB, and here you can see it laid out next to uh, sRGB, and you can see it is quite a bit larger, especially in those colors. And that's really what drove that development of that space. Now, at the time, there was digital capture 98. That's, I think, when you could finally buy a $20,000 2 megapixel camera from Kodak or a $35,000 6 megapixel from Kodak. But really, that's <laughs> we're just at the beginning of high end uh, digital capture. Well, it became apparent to Kodak that these two spaces had a weakness and they couldn't contain the colors that were going to be captured by digital uh, cameras. And so they set out to develop a working space or a container space that would be able to contain the colors of a digital camera. And Profoto RGB is the only space developed for digital capture. And that alone should tell you that they're probably the right thing to do is to use Profoto RGB. But what Kodak's thought was is, look, at we want a color space that can contain every color possible that exists in the natural world. And so that's what they set out to do. And of course, they created a fairly large space. Here it is compared to the other two. And uh, the downside or what's criticized because it contains colors that are outside of human vision. But that really doesn't matter because we don't use those colors. In fact, it's criticized because it's too large and there are colors that you know, or beyond the capability of, of devices. Well, that really doesn't matter that it's big and the color's there that we're not going to use. What the key is, is we have enough numbers within the color space within our data that we can actually use it. And that's why if you're going to use Pro Photo RGB, you really have to use a 16-bit workflow because only the 16-bit has enough ability to maintain tonal gradations without posterization. If you're using Adobe RGB or sRGB, they don't have enough colors to worry about that, so you can just go ahead and work in 8-bit if you want. So let's take a quick look and compare them on a computer. I'm going to use a program called Color Think here. This allows me to plot colors and profiles in a three-dimensional space. It's actually quite interesting. First, we're going to take a look at sRGB, and of course, uh, no real relevance because it's just this it is what it is so what we want to do is okay sRGB is this space that means any color within this area from top to bottom is basically tone or uh, luminosity and then the further you get from the middle the more saturated the color and of course as you get more saturated yellows they stay lighter more saturated blues are uh, darker and of course as you make them darker, they, they end up with less and less saturation. Let's now compare this. Let's, I'm going to turn this back to white, and I'm going to turn on Adobe RGB, and we'll turn it into a wireframe. And this gives us a really good visual on the difference. And notice how much, much more blues and greens Adobe RGB can manage than sRGB. And that was the reason that Adobe developed it, is because sRGB was limited in its ability to contain colors that were within the capabilities of CMYK printers at the time. And so it gives you a pretty good idea of what it can do, and it's a larger space. Now let's compare Adobe RGB. We'll turn it to white. And let's compare it to Pro Photo RGB. And you can see how much bigger it is. And Pro Photo RGB was developed for the same reason as a, that Adobe had developed Adobe RGB. 
They needed a space that was within the capabilities of technology. And Adobe RGB no longer had the ability to record and store colors that were uh, captured by digital cameras. And to give you a really good idea of that, what we're going to do next is take a real good look. So what I've got here is I've got this image here. And let's go smaller here. This is a section of a target by uh, Bill Atkinson. So it's very, very old. These images are, what I did is I, I basically downsized it so it pixelated. So each pixel now is kind of a color that I can represent in this Color Think program. So let's go back to Color Think. And we're going to turn that on first. And here you can see those colors spread over this three-dimensional area. Basically, each of these dots represents one of the dots in that uh, file I just showed you. Now, what I'm going to do is turn on sRGB. And you can see all the colors that were captured and stored in that are now quite apparent because uh, anything that you can't see is inside the space. Let's turn on Adobe RGB. And you can see still we have a lot of colors, especially over in here. Let's turn, let's make those dots a tiny bit bigger so they're a little more obvious. There we go. A lot of colors that are in our file that even in the blues and the greens where Adobe RGB is strongest. And of course, if we turn on Profoto RGB and we make it white, suddenly you see that pretty much all the colors now are contained. There's a few that are right at the edge, but for the most part, uh, they're contained. So let's talk about what happens if we need to move those colors into those spaces. So here's our colors. And what I can do is I can turn this into a vector. And what it'll do is it'll make a line from where the color starts to where it has to end up if we want to push it into sRGB. And you can see all of these colors move to the edge of that sRGB space. And if we turn that off, you can see how all those colors end up kind of blocking up. And that's the, one of the challenges is when we do this, we can block them up. Now, there's some rendering intents that help avoid that a little bit. But let's now change it to Adobe RGB. And we'll turn Adobe RGB on. And you can see how we still have to move a lot of colors a long, long way to get them into the Adobe RGB space. So all these colors that are way out here are gone once we make them Adobe RGB. And only if we uh, convert, if we now do that uh, to in Pro Photo, now you'll notice that we have, have hardly any lines. At the very fringe, we have a few that we have to move a, a little bit. You can see these yellows. And I think there's a few greens that have to move a little bit. Well, maybe one green. But we don't have, so we can keep our colors where they are, and we don't have to change those colors until we're ready to go to an output device. Now, how big of a problem is it? Well, let's do one more thing for this video. Just to, like I said, all I'm trying to do is make sure you understand the importance of choosing a good working space. So I'm going to turn on the space for, this is the color space for an Epson P9000 printer printing on Epson Premium Luster paper. So these are all the colors that printer is capable of printing on a sheet of paper, on that particular paper. Now, if our image is in sRGB, then any color, any, anywhere you see color, that's colors that could be in the file and that could be printed, and yet sRGB will clip and remove. If we turn on Adobe RGB, we still have this huge area of color here and these areas of reds and uh, greens that the printer can print, and yet we can't print because they're not in the file anymore because we clipped it to Adobe RGB. And of course, if we go to Profoto RGB, um, you can see the entire space is contained. So we don't have to lose any colors at all, and we can maximize the capability of our device when we convert it to that space. And that's what we're going to talk about the next video is how do we convert these colors? Let's go back here. Let's turn the Profoto off, and let's turn our colors on and go to points. How do we convert these colors that are outside of our printer space to the printer space to maximize the quality? Now, if we go and turn on Adobe RGB, just for as an example. All right, so now you can see anything that you, any color you can see that's inside the wireframe 
is a color the printer can print, and yet Adobe RGB would clip. So all of the subtlety of these colors here, you would lose because all of this mass would go into Adobe, and then when you print it, you can't pull it back out. And so, and as printers get better, here's a bunch of blues that you would lose as well. And so you'd actually start blocking up, in this particular image, you would block up your yellows pretty bad. Now it wouldn't look horrible, it wouldn't look dis, you know, disgusting or anything, but it's certainly not the maximum quality you can get. I really firmly believe that the whole idea of a good color managed workflow is that we keep it, all of our data that we shoot and we don't mess with the data. We can manipulate it and do anything we want with it, but we still store it and we don't force it into smaller spaces to store it because what we want to do is wait until we go to another device and we basically can fit it into that device's capability. And so that's what the next video is about. When we have an image like we have this here and we're ready to print it to our printer, how does the color management system know what to do with that data? And it's really about what are called rendering intents. And that's what I'm gonna do the next video about so we can explain the difference between the two main rendering intents we use as photographers. And hopefully it helps you understand the difference between the two, as well as graphically see where those colors are going, because it's actually pretty fascinating what happens to all those colors when I graph those into a uh, color thing. So anyway, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell to watch uh, so you can see when I get part four <laughs> ready, which I don't think it'll be too long because it's actually pretty simple. And then I think at that point we'll be ready for part five, which will actually be how to set it up and the two main things that you have control of and the two things that most photographers don't understand and don't do when they set it up. And that's why they have trouble with it working. Anyway, thanks for watching. See ya.